Um, welcome to today's training, Cross-Cultural Sensitivity, presented by Walid Gemmo from the Arab American and Kildeen Council, or the ACC. Um, before we jump in, I just have a bit of housekeeping um, to cover. There will be no certificates or CEs for today's training. Um, this is strictly informational, so again, no um, certificates or CEs will be sent out. I will be sending out an evaluation at the end of the training in the chat. This evaluation will provide feedback to our presenter and house helps us improve future trainings. So we would appreciate if you um, filled out the evaluation that I will send out at the end of the training in the chat. So just a bit of um, Teams information before we get started. I've been mentioning the chat quite a bit, so depending on what version of Teams you have, um, your kind of control panel is going to either be on the top or the bottom. The chat is a little bubble with two lines through it. Um, you can put your questions in there, and I'll be putting some information throughout the training in the chat as well. So. Um, it's really important for you all to be able to navigate to that. Right next to the chat, there is a little smiley face with a hand next to it. That is where you can use the raise your hand feature or you can um, give reactions that way as well. You also have a little camera and a mic icon. We do ask that you keep your microphone muted throughout the training just to cut down on background noise. There is um, a little over 40 of us now, so it just can get a little noisy if um, someone is unmuted. Um, and then the camera, so those will have a little line through it if they are off. Although it is not required for you to have your camera on, we do love to see everyone's wonderful faces. Um, and today's session will be, you know, pretty interactive. So we encourage you to turn your cameras on um, if you would like. Um, pretty sure that wraps up my housekeeping for this afternoon. So we'll leave whenever you are ready. Uh, questions, Caitlin, at the end, right? Oh yes, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. So. We will have um, a good amount of time at the end of the training for questions. So if you really have a burning question and you don't want to forget it, you can put it in the chat and I will remember to read that at the end. Um, from, from asking questions during the training. Um, since and then there will be also, Caitlin, uh, useful Arabic phrases that will be sent with the evaluation. Yes, absolutely. So follow the training. Um, I can send out the slides to everyone and then also uh, Willie has offered us useful Arabic phrases, a handout that I can give to everyone as well. Um, and again, I will email that out um, following the training. Okay, anything else I missed before you get started? Uh, my voice is clear to everyone, I guess, by just, okay, great, great. So good afternoon, everybody, and, and uh, thank you for joining us, actually, and joining this uh, training, Cultural Competency versus Cultural Humility. This is a cross-cultural sensitivity training, uh, diving and uh, engaging and exploring uh, the Arab and Chaldean community in the state of Michigan. And then not only that, but also uh, learning about the ingredients of the culture and some sensitive issues too. Uh, I promise you today, after the two hours and a half that we have, uh, that you will walk into my shoes at least for two miles, and then you will see things, hopefully the way an Arab or Chaldean sees that. And then uh, you will be able to use that package of information uh, uh, into the services that you're providing uh, for your clients. Just want to uh, also mention the fact that uh, in the journey of life that we are in, this is not just does not end here. Uh, I'm going to be available for you at the end of the PowerPoint. There will be my email and my telephone number in case you have uh, to follow up afterward that I will be available for you just in case you need any questions or any kind of help with any of the clients that you are providing 
services uh, too. My name is Walid Gammo. I'm just gonna, I wish we have this in person, but hey, uh, this is what we have right now. We'll, we'll do with what we have and try to do the best. Uh, thank you, Caitlin, uh, for uh, being supportive in this area. And thank you for the also Oakland uh, Community Health Network for inviting me. It is a privilege for me to share with you about my culture and when it comes to the clinical issues, when it comes to mental health and substance abuse, um, uh, uh, addiction, and just understanding the Arabic Middle Eastern people the way they are culturally, uh, not politically. Uh, just to let you know who is bringing the information to you, I want to introduce myself uh, briefly, uh, and then uh, hopefully you will get an understanding where uh, all of this information is coming to you from. Uh, my hometown is Amman, Jordan. I am Jordanian and have been in this country since 1979. So been here for almost, uh, I would say 42, 43 years. Uh, my favorite hobbies are volleyball, soccer, cooking, swimming and spending time with the family and, and also investing in young people uh, and investing uh, about the culture uh, in people in general of all ages. Uh, I graduated from Spring, Spring Arbor University in 1982 with a BA in sociology and social work and some theology teaching, uh, uh, learning. Uh, short, shortly after that, uh, in 1982, I went back to my uh, country in Jordan. I served in the army for two years. That's part of the compulsory service. And I ended up serving in the military police uh, as a military police officer in a prison uh, kind of a compound situation. Uh, 1985, I came back to the United States and to further my education. And uh, in 1986, I got married. And then now we have four children, young adult children. Uh, and then uh, 1988, I graduated with a master in social work uh, focusing on the mental health uh, and health uh, from Wayne State University. I joined the Arab American and Chaldean Council uh, uh, in 1988 until 2001. And then I uh, took another, uh, I resigned from ACC, took another job, worked in the school uh, from uh, 2001 until 2016. Uh, I was the district school social worker and District 504 coordinator at Oak Park School District. And then I left from there uh, also to work at uh, Lanphier Schools. And I was there a social worker working with uh, uh, just in the special education department. Uh, we've developed during that time, we uh, in both schools actually developed a lot of after school tutoring programs for Iraqi and Syrian refugees. Uh, and their families and uh, just the programs basically began to ex uh, expand at that time and and uh, really gain ground uh, with the after school tutoring programs. 2010 I was lucky and privileged to be nominated and awarded Michigan School Social Worker of the Year. Uh, 2016 as I mentioned I retired took an early retirement and then at that time, uh, I thought I will, you know, do some private work, but I was called back to ACC where uh, the Arab American and Chaldean Council uh, by Dr. Uh, is, is headed by Dr. Fakhouri. Uh, she is the president and CEO of this agency. And uh, I came back to work as a part time. Uh, and I did work as a part time from 2016 until 2020. Uh, was putting in more hours, so she said, why don't you join full time? I said, of course. And uh, when I left actually ACC, ACC stayed in my heart. I took ACC wh wherever I went. So I have done a lot of cross-cultural sensitivity training for the past uh, 35 years. Uh, in addition of, uh, to all of that, I've served as a, uh, an associate pastor with the Arabic Evangelical Alliance Church. Uh, uh, I was also uh, appointed by the governor uh, of Michigan, uh, uh, Gretchen Whitmer, uh, to, uh, to the state uh, 
Commission of Services to the Aging, and my term will end in uh, August of 2023. Uh, so, I choose my time to really invest in people. Uh, I know I'm 64, just celebrated my birthday yesterday and uh, uh, still feel young at heart. And my, my passion is working with people, especially in the area of crisis intervention, as well as investing in the young people uh, of what I have learned over the past uh, 35 years. I also have through ACC a program uh, on the radio and that program is basically uh, every Thursday, 11.30 on WNZK, uh, 6.90 a.m. Uh, it's done in Arabic from 11.30 to 12, where we really try to reach the community with the uh, helping them and empowering them, especially parents, to provide cross-cultural uh, parenting support and dealing with whatever the challenges in the community uh, at, at the present time. Uh, so uh, let's actually go to the next slide. And there are questions here that I would like you to try to explore in the next, uh, let's say, five minutes, Caitlin, yep. uh, to answer these questions. This is a uh, Arab Chaldean culture quiz, uh, just to test your knowledge. This is not to uh, but really to add to your knowledge in a way I consider every test a learning experience for all of us for me and for you so go ahead and answer those questions and at the end toward the end right before we you start uh, we start the segment on on question and answer we will try to go over these uh, questions together so time please five minutes and then uh, you can go ahead and start answering those questions. All right, I've got 213, so let's reconvene at 217. That is five minutes. I do encourage you um, to answer these questions what, with whatever current knowledge you have instead of Googling the answer. Um, and like Waleed said, we will address the questions at the end. Um, uh, the training, so go ahead and take those five minutes. You all passed the quiz, just don't worry about the grade. Did you see a comment in the chat that someone is unable to see the screen? Um, I am screen sharing, so you should be able to see the screen if for some reason you are not. I do recommend um, just leaving Teams and rejoining the meeting. Oftentimes that resolves um, any issues that people have. Um, I also wanted to let you know that um, if you wanted to um, you know, see Walid while he's speaking. You can also um, find his name and pin his um, video uh, to your screen so you can see a larger image of him while also still seeing the slides. And the PowerPoint will be shared with all of you uh, at the end. Caitlin will yes. send that.
Alrighty, I've got 217. It has been about five minutes. So just make a note of how you answered those questions and we'll, we will review the answers at the end. So what is ACC stand for? I just want to give you a brief uh, 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 like uh, tour of ACC in a way uh, uh, to help you understand as a resource for you in the community. It's called the Arab American and Chaldean Council. It was established in 1979. And uh, from 1979, uh, it was actually uh, established in a small office in uh, the International Institute down by Wayne State University. And now up to date, we have almost 40 uh, outreach programs and outreach offices that is a one stop shop in uh, providing many services. ACC is a bridge of understanding, delivering uh, core human services to all people. So it's not just about Arabs or Chaldeans, but we really our doors are open to uh, uh, all uh, 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 kinds of people from all walks of life. Uh, the purpose uh, of this here uh, training is to increase cross-cultural understanding through education, and this is what we're doing here today. This training is av available through ACC to help health, mental health, and any human service providers who are uh, non-Arabs and non-Chaldeans to understand the Middle Eastern people and culture to be able to provide uh, you uh, or provide your clients with culturally sensitive and effective uh, uh, services. And I always say that if you love your what you do, you will never work one day in your life. And just imagine we are getting paid. Uh, this is not a, a, a job that we do to, to, to be rich. It's a job to do to make people's pe uh, lives uh, uh, have quality of life and rich in their life in, in, in one way or another. Uh, the ACC uh, has the behavioral health programs, and this is in the Tri-County area. There is one in Detroit, uh, Wayne County. There is one in Warndale, uh, which is right by the Dearborn and Detroit area. Those uh, There is one in Macomb, one in Oakland. We have infant mental health programs, uh, home-based programs. Those are actually to provide uh, behavioral health services. Uh, we have uh, bilingual, a trilingual psychiatrist. We have bilingual, trilingual social workers, counselors, case managers. Uh, so this is uh, this provide uh, uh, mental health services to uh, uh, patients or clients who come in with uh, top of notch uh, kind of services. We also have the community outreach programs. This is one of them that we are doing uh, here today as cross-cultural training. We have uh, the senior services, a focus uh, hope program. Uh, we have the youth recreation uh, and mentoring program in the Seven Mile, uh, where we have a huge and large area of sport, like a small arena where they come in and play after school. Uh, with coaches, uh, play basketball, ball, play volleyball. They have computers actually for after school tutoring program uh, to provide them with computers and access to computers to come in with their homework uh, to be able to help them. Uh, also, uh, there is the Pantry of Plenty program, which is uh, a collaboration between the Food uh, Forgotten Harvest uh, in addition to ACC and other agencies that are coming every Thursday from 10 to 1 or 10 until food is is out where they where we provide between 35 to 45, maybe 50 pounds every week to almost uh, close to 500 families in the Tri-County area. And these are uh, basically to help them uh, uh, with the food aspect so they can at least keep some cash in their pocket to spend somewhere else. Also, we have the Department of Health and Human Services offices. We have almost 
uh, nine to ten uh, uh, outreach programs there uh, located inside of the Department of Health and Human Services to facilitate translation, to facilitate a completion of application, to uh, uh, work as a bridge between the caseworker at the DHHS and uh, uh, the community so that we can make things a little easier and more productive when it comes to uh, limited English speaking uh, clients. Uh, we have uh, also job training, job placement, where we provide a lot of resume preparation. We have English as a second language. Uh, we have two classes. One is uh, the first level, and then the second is the advanced level. And we have citizenship classes that we provide for people who are applying for citizenship so they can learn and, and be uh, productive uh, citizens of this country. We have the refugees program uh, where we provide services and uh, mentor them and uh, get them adjusted and acclimated in the new main uh, culture. And we provide uh, job coaching for them and even resume preparation. Uh, we have the primary health care clinic which basically it's a clinic on Warren uh, and that provides, it's, it's manned by a primary doctor with nurses and uh, uh, people to provide a primary health care for uh, people with uh, insured, uninsured, uh, no insurance. You know, people who just come in and, and they need uh, some help in their native language uh, uh, by a, a certified MD doctor. We have substance abuse prevention programs where we go to schools and provide eight to ten weeks of uh, uh, a classroom uh, to teach them how, on how to say no to drugs and how to arm them with the facts and information so that they become stronger in the face of temptations and, and, and uh, with this uh, epidemic that we have in, in the state of Michigan. We have the WIC program, Woman, Infant and uh, Child program. So this is just basically to give you uh, uh, an, uh, an at a glance kind of uh, information about the resources that we have in the community. And you can always go to the uh, www.myacc.org and, and really uh, find out more information uh, about uh, the Arab American and Chaldean Council. Let's go to the next slide, please. Building a solid foundation for cross-cultural understanding, the Arab American and Chaldean cultures and languages are deep and rich in their ingredients. And one must
contains 30% of it Arabic. So I, as an Arab, if I go to Africa, I would be able to communicate 30% of the time in Arabic. Uh, the uh, businessmen, the uh, when they went there and emigrated there, they introduced the language, they introduce, introduce the culture, they introduce whatever the products they brought in into that country, into Africa. OK, uh, Arab American from come from various background, religious background, Muslims, uh, Christians, Jews and the minority religious and religious groups. Each group may have even several sub sects in their uh,
Alrighty, there we go. Thank you. So you, your ear or your ears actually have heard the different uh, kind of music. Uh, of course, I can't, I can't give you everything, all the kinds of music that we have, but we have the folklore, we have the traditional, we have the uh, the recent, more current kind of music. Uh, so these are the kind of. I know it's very. It's it's it. You're not used to hearing those kinds of music, and it doesn't sound like. You might get into the movement of the body and things like that with the drums, but this is how clients, when they come here, they will have to adjust to the new. I will assimilate American culture to the point where you will not know me, but as an American. And that's quite impossible for me to completely assimilate, even though I'm speaking without accent or maybe with a heavy accent uh, when it comes to the English language, when it comes to my um, complete culture. I am who I am because of my past. So. I speak the language, I speak the Arabic language, and in this sense is that's who I am, a bilingual, bicultural, uh, the two in one person. So assimilation, I cannot assimilate, but I can acculturate. Acculturation on the other hand, means taking the cream of the crop of both cultures and living sort of like hanging between earth and sky. Right, so uh, a non-educated background. They haven't finished the high school yet. Uh, 
They haven't even finished the third grade or fourth grade. So there are places in the state of Michigan, in the tri-county area, where a lot of these limited English speaking people would love to just congregate around in a high populated like Dearborn, like, uh, for example, Madison Heights, where they can actually uh, and these places you can't go by without speaking the language, whether Arabic or Chaldean. Even though it's populated with highly educated people in the, those places, but still, uh, uh, unfortunately, the limited English language will uh, drive people to be a part uh, of those uh, cultures that really have made things accessible. We have more spices in in those places uh, than we have spices in the Middle East, for God's sake. We have, I mean, everything is uh, prepared and, 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 and basically are part of the culture, just, just like bringing a piece of the Middle East with everything that it has and plant it here in the United States. If you want to remember anything from this, you see the two eyes in the big head and then the two smaller eyes in those big heads. Remember, those are two perspective on everything. That's what we mean when we call two in one. OK, let's go to the next slide. Let's look at some important definition. What is a refugee? A refugee is a person who flees persecution and they run away to protect and not to die, basically. Uh, uh, and they, uh, refugees are continuously coming to the United States. Now we're looking at refugees from Ukraine. This uh, has been approved by, I think, the, the administration, Biden administration. There is about 100,000 people who are going to be coming uh, from Ukraine. So we have to learn their culture and we have to learn their uh, ingredients in their culture and how we can really provide services for them. Just like the Middle Eastern refugees that have been really moved from one place to another and have accumulated traumas because of the war that they lived in, because they ran with only their clothes on their back and with their kids uh, running to uh, other countries like Jordan. Jordan has about a 1.5 million Syrian refugees. And prior to that, they had close to a million Iraqi refugees. And now we're seeing the Ukrainian people are almost 4.5 million who have been uh, refuged in, in different uh, different countries so that they can uh, at least uh, 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 have safety in, in their life. Uh, what is the Afghanis? Afghanis are a humanitarian. They call them a humanitarian parolee. They're legally in the U.S. They can enter the U.S. between 60 to 120 days as Afghanis and they can stay here and they provide them as much as help just like the refugees. Asylee, on the other hand, is persons fleeing persecution who enter another country by means of other than established refugee process and who later seek legal protection status uh, uh, in the country to which they fled to. And of course, immigrants are those who are uh, making decisions to leave their countries uh, to another country uh, seeking permanent residency and they make decisions uh, without uh, being impacted by, by the war. Let's go to the next slide. Let's talk about some family role in the Arab and Chaldean uh, cultural ingredients. What makes an Arab an Arab? What makes a Chaldean Chaldean? What are the ingredients? It's a culture that puts great emphasis on religion. They call uh, the Middle Eastern people the if, if God is willing people. Morality is based on uh, religious beliefs. The law are the laws are predominantly Islamic laws and religion and government are pretty much are inseparable. God's name is mentioned in all of our conversation uh, throughout in the middle throughout the Middle Eastern uh, people. So that's how much impactful the uh, religion, whether Muslims or Christians for that fact or uh, any other uh, sub uh, uh, groups in with with their uh, different religious uh, background. 
it's a culture, uh, family oriented culture. What do we mean by family oriented culture? The family's well being comes before as a unit, comes before the well being of an individual. It's an extended uh, family and strong family ties. There is a high uh, expectation for each individual to represent their family in the most reputable way. Marriage of cousins is still practiced, but it is disappearing in, in, in the Middle East, and it's more disappearing also here as they uh, uh, immigrate or come as refugees to this country. It's a, a culture of authoritarian. It's a culture of hospitality. Culture of hospitality means this is if you knock on a Middle Eastern home, that door is open. You will be treated as soon as you enter that home like kings and queens, uh, and they would provide you with whatever food they have. This is part of the one of the highest codes of honors in the Middle East to be hospitable. Of course, you put this in the process of acculturation. It could change and it could remain the same. And honestly, they teach their kids even in the mother's womb about what it means to be hospitable. And, and this is taught throughout the development of uh, children's uh, stages of development. It's a culture, authoritarian culture, ma male dominated. And just like I mentioned, uh, authoritarianism, this is a patriarchal system, distinct role for males and females. Uh, this element permeates the whole structure of the Arab world and the Chaldean uh, in the Chaldean community, not only father uh, as the head of the household, but parents to children, teacher to students, master to disciple, boss to worker and in all domains of the Arab society. I have lived when I came here as a patriarch, when I came from Jordan and, and lived in, in this country, we had four generations in my home. We have my wife's grandmother who lived to be 105. We have my wife's parents, my in-laws, and we have me and my wife and then my kids. That's four generations in the household. I have to submit my authority as a male uh, in the house to my wife's grandmother's uh, because of her age and because of, uh, you know, it's a culture of respect of the elderly. If she says, if she moves, she doesn't have to say any words. If she moves her head, that means no, this is a no-no. If she says, okay, that means she gives the green light and, and everything goes pretty much the same. Imagine me who's been educated here in the United States, who assumes role, my role as a male, and my wife as a role in, her, uh, 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 in the United States, that we submit that as a respect for the older generation. It's a, a culture of respect for the elderly, uh, which means you will find that respect is an element in the culture, which is part of the norm of uh, uh, and one of the concepts that we we learn as early. I took care of you while you were young. You take care of me while I'm old. Giving the best seat in the house for the elderly. And also young people will have to stand when greeting an elderly person. Even some of us will have to kiss their hand, and I don't know what that hand, where it came from, but that shows how uh, uh, respectful of an older person uh, uh, will, will be providing those. It's a culture of shame-based culture. I will explain a little bit later with a picture about that. And it's a culture of visitation. We have a room in tip-top shape in the house. That quarter or that room is ready to receive guests Un, uh, in an unplanned manner or before without even having them to call and come in uh, to visit. There are dynamics of also the culture. Uh, freedom is limited. Uh, we know that is freedom is a freedom given to us in the Middle East and we cannot go beyond those boundaries. And when you put that freedom in the process of acculturation coming here to the United States, we know that we have freedom here that we own. So there is a huge uh, uh, problem or conflict or challenge for that matter when it when it uh, is uh, a, a freedom we don't own and freedom we have too much of it to a certain degree we are enslaved in a way to our own freedoms because we might have too much of it here 
And I always look at freedom in the sense uh, from a third world perspective, in a sense that a freedom that is uh, something you function within your own freedom, you're responsible and you have your freedom stops when it impacts in a negative way the other uh, people uh, living next door or living with you in this journey of life. Language is very poetic. We speak between the lines. We have we express through uh, poems and we express through music. Because we lived in dictatorial countries and we cannot express anything uh, in criticism. We can criticize the government and those in power, but in between the line, between the lines, not direct in a very indirect way. Uh, time is deferred. Uh, what we mean by time is deferred. We are more focused on the event. Uh, when we get there, we get there. When we leave, we leave, so to speak. And uh, this is not really acceptable when it comes to time is money here in the United States. But really, sometimes you might find parents who are not uh, 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 really efficient and, and time focused in this area. Uh, all right, let's go to the next slide. Shame based culture, what it means, what do we mean by shame based culture? Shame based culture is is a culture that puts great emphasis on the reputation. Honor is even stronger than death itself. So when it comes to mental health, when it comes to treating an addict or when it comes of dealing with uh, uh, mentally ill people or psychological problems, it's a hidden phenomenon. It's close to impossible. And depending on the, uh, uh, I guess, acculturation and assimilation of people, depending on, on the education of people, that's how much uh, the wall of denial could be either, either thin or thick. So the shame-based culture means that uh, 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 because it's a shame-based culture, any shame problem is attached to it a shame-based problem. The, and then you attach to it the high religious uh, culture too, you get a double whammy of a, th a wall that is thick as you can imagine. And beginning to, to chip at that wall is uh, a very difficult process. And only through developing trust at all levels when it comes to connecting with clients who come in with this package of the culture. Let's go to the young people. The next slide, please. Uh, this is a concept where also I developed over the years, and I thought that this would be a very important one when uh, working with young people. There are three imp uh, powers impacting their uh, stages of development. The first stage is the uh, first power, which is the home culture. The second power is the American culture, uh, and that's the second power, and then between the first power and the second power, there is cultural conflict. If you see here in this uh, small overlapping uh, two circles uh, between the third, uh, first power and the second power is the cultural conflict. And of course you have the uh, child himself and the third power is the question, who am I? And the personality, the identity, basically. Many times here, if there is no stability in the first bilingual bicultural status, the two in one, the parents, if they're not stable, that's going to trickle down to the uh, uh, second power, which is basically uh, the present culture that we are living in. And that's going to impact the stages of development of kids to the point where when they grow a little bit older, they might even have an issue with their identity. So there could be an identity crisis. In this concept here, uh, I always say promote the main culture, promote the American culture more than the Arabic or Chaldean culture, because that is going to give, I cannot come to my kids and say poo on the American culture. And if I put down the American culture, I'm putting my kids down. So it is very crucial. And this is what we teach in a cross-cultural parenting. Uh, when it comes to raising kids in two cultures, we teach the parents to be able to promote the American culture more 
because that will give more stability in the long run. If there is no stability, the result is going to be confusion. The assimilation process is quicker and the gap is wider in uh, the uh, between the two cultures, between the first and second generation, and that will definitely create identity crisis. Let's go to the next one. So let's view uh, the let's look at the Arab Chaldean child versus the new environment. If there is a strong discipline at home versus leniency at school, the result child will act out. Because kids want to belong, they want to fit in. If the first uh, culture, which is the Middle Eastern culture at home is not stable, then kids will look out to be able to fit that sense of belonging. And eventually uh, uh, what being promoted in school is negated at home and what being promoted in home is being negated at school. And that's the conflict that takes place. And this is where the child is gonna uh, be acting out. Parents are, are of limited English language proficiency. The result child parent or reversal. Kids actually become parents to a certain degree and they assume the authority of parents. And that's what we call parent role, role reversal in the in the uh, cross cultural uh, experience. Uh, and, and you know how much kids are mischief and then they can get away with a murder pretty much if they want to if the parents will use them to translate or facilitate translation. So I would say no, no for kids translating for parents always use uh, an objective outside uh, person when it comes to school or even when it comes to uh, 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 providing services to parents who are having trouble with kids. Child is embarrassed by parents education and and English. This result does not want parents to participate participate in school. Remember in the Middle East is more centralized uh, education system. Here we have a decentralized education system. Here it depends uh, on the participation and collaboration of parents, teachers. Back in the old country, even the Ministry of uh, Education is called the Ministry of Education and Discipline. Here is only Ministry of Education. Let's go to the next slide, please. A uh, negative stereotype of the Arabs and Chaldeans for kids uh, in the media, a uh, child may deny his identity. They don't want to be called Arabs or Chaldeans. They don't want to be associated. Uh, and I've seen this in school while I worked in school. They might even identif identify themselves as Italian or Spanish or some other uh, 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 cultures that is not Middle Eastern Arabs or Chaldeans. This is sad, but this is where a responsibility falls on the parents. Uh, different, different food, different traditions on a daily basis. Ethnic versus uh, American, internal versus external. That becomes an issue uh, uh, regarding uh, the uh, conflict between East and West. Desire to fit in, uh, feeling of no sense of belonging at home will uh, create a res uh, the result will be wrong choices, experimenting with drugs and negative attention seeking behaviors uh, and, and belonging that seeking to belong to group that are inappropriate. Let's go to the next slide. Unfair treatment of male versus female result feeling unvalued for the females, excluded double standard and further and deeper conflict with parents and culture when it comes to female, male, uh, uh, unfair treatment. Concept of third culture child, three powers impacting stages of development. Of development. Uh, this is acute conflict and rebelliousness that comes uh, as a result in the lives of the young people. Let's go to the next slide. Norms of in the Arab American communities. I'm going to leave that uh, for you to read. It's very easy to read. Uh, Let's go to the next slide. We're getting closer to really uh, opening it up for a uh, question and answer. High context culture uh, versus low context culture. What is a high context culture? It's a culture that uh, including much of the Middle East, Asia, Africa and South America are more focused on the relational part of it, more collectivist, intuitive and 
contemplative. This means that people in these cultures emphasize on interpersonal relationship. Developing trust is an important first step to any business transaction or any service that we provide. Uh, what's a high context culture? It's uh, more communication. Uh, the ways we communicate is that are implicit and rely heavy on the context. It's more, if you ask an Arab, what is your ear? In, in this, I'm trying to, this is, this is what it means, embellishing and beating around the bush, indirect. And then if you ask an American, where is your ear? This is my ear. This is the difference between high context culture uh, versus low context culture. It's basically implicit, indirect versus explicit in the area of communication. And let's move to the next slide, please. When it comes to low context, and you can read this on your own. Also, the next uh, slide. This is uh, high context uh, culture versus low context. You can read that on your own. Direct versus indirect communication. And let's move the uh, next one is context comparison, high context culture versus low context culture. You can read that on your own too. Let me try to share with you about cross-cultural communication guidelines, and then we will stop to uh, for question and answer. Uh, uh, Khalil Jubran is a great poet writer. He wrote that uh, friendship is always a sweet responsibility, never an opportunity. So it is our responsibility to be able to uh, really, uh, I guess, exercise and take into consideration uh, when working with other cultures, uh, especially when we in, when it comes to communication, how can we reduce those barriers of communication? And these are some of the suggestions. Uh, this is not uh, a list that uh, you could actually add to it uh, at your own, from your own experience. Building relationship is very important. Uh, no cultural assumption. Do not assume because you learned all the information uh, uh, from the media perspective that you are competent that you uh, can be able to really provide. Sometimes it's very difficult, um, especially when it comes to the cues. Uh, for example, if I'm if I come to your office and you are my therapist or you are the person who providing me with services, if I am looking you up in the eyes, according to my culture, the standard of my culture, I'm disrespecting the authority or the person who's sitting in front of me. If I'm looking down, that means I am giving you the authority. You are the expert. You are the one who's going to be providing me with advice and a problem solving kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, work or services that you're going to be providing. According to the American standard, now, if I am looking you up in the eye, it means good eye to eye contact. But if I'm not, that means I have shifty. Eyes. That means I'm not trustworthy. I am trying to hide something. So we need to be cognizant of how we translate uh, behaviors and how we translate uh, those uh, kind of uh, behavior within the context of the culture. Uh, so no cultural assumption, please. This you know what this will make uh, if we divide the word assumption. Don't judge behaviors according to your standard. Don't use the media as your only source of information. Use the media, but use other uh, sources of information. Do not use politics to understand culture. It will not do you, it will do you a disservice uh, when it comes to providing services to uh, clients who come in with multiple, multi uh, faceted kind of uh, uh, problems. Respect cultural differences. I would say listen, observe, describe rather than evaluate and these are things that we've been trained in uh, show acceptance without stereotype accept period uh, the language of love has many ways of as going as far as you could in in uh, uh, representing the service that you are providing for people 
because when you judge, it pollutes our vision, it pollutes our understanding. Judgment does not carry us in the culture of humility uh, uh, far. Uh, uh, so I would say always be cognizant of basically loving people, period, as they are. And this goes two way street uh, in in the uh, uh, the, the cross cultural de developing a solid foundation for cross cultural understanding. Uh, show acceptance without stereotype. Take time and be patient to learn about other culture from people themselves and not only from books. Uh, learn uh, how to speak another language. Uh, maybe just uh, by using some simple uh, greeting uh, 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 terminology that would help you to walk in the hearts of people. Be real when dealing with people. This is not just a patient, but be focused on those patients that bringing the culture with them and, and real understanding leads to real appreciation and real appreciation leads to real relation. Be proactive most of the time and reactive 10% of the time. I hope that uh, has given you enough uh, information uh, at least to trigger more of an interactive and question uh, that you have in your mind. Let's go to the next slide, please. It has been my privilege to be able to share with you about my culture and I am all ears, two of them, and my head to receive questions at this point. Go ahead, Caitlin. Alrighty, everyone. So feel free to put your questions in the chat. Um, and I'm happy to read them aloud, or you can unmute yourself to ask those questions. Um, just in case we do have a lot of questions that once I ask that you um, use the raise your hand feature so I can call on you and everyone's not unmuting all at once. Um, so go ahead and put those questions in the chat or raise your hand. And by the way, the useful Arabic phrases that you have, uh, those are going to be sent to you. Those are like, uh, how are you? Uh, it's uh, uh, hello, marhaba, kif halak, kif halik. Those are written in the English alphabets to help you uh, pronounce those the right way when it, you come in contact with the clients. And then before the end today, we're going to answer the uh, quiz, cultural quiz after the questions. So make sure to give us at least 10 minutes for that. OK, sounds good. Um, so Mary B, why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi. I'd like to see the face behind the question, please. I'm here. So the question is, um, this is a really lot of good information. So what if I want to like further my uh, cultural competence and humility, then what are some like maybe things in the community that you would suggest that I would go to or maybe I don't you know, maybe there's some. Uh, yeah, just some things that might help me get even more familiar other than just interacting with people in the clinic. Yes, I would say uh, look around you where you're living if there is neighbors. Uh, I know this is, you know, we are in the COVID and I know this has put a damper on everything, but I would say reach out, uh, go to a store uh, that is Middle Eastern store and just look around, see how people are interacting. Um, develop friendship with people who are in this area uh, of providing services. Uh, and then communicate with them. Because remember, cultural humility is a lifelong. Uh, exchange a, 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 a recipe uh, for your neighbors. Uh, they will exchange that with you and will invite you for a cup of coffee. Uh, I am always available uh, to, you know, go to uh, the uh, Arabic um, Chaldean agencies let them know that you are there, that you are around, that you want to know more, uh, yet you are interested. Maybe there are classes in Arabic that might be offered uh, at the university level that you might want to enlist to really uh, get strong in this area. 
So uh, can it I ask? Work? Sorry. Yes. Oh, so I I just was I wonder. Sometimes I feel a little bit awkward that maybe if I uh, say, oh, I would like to learn more about your culture, or like, is that too direct, or is that okay? No, okay. that's absolutely a good direct way of of uh, uh, of saying it. And and then you might want to uh, learn the Arabic language and learn some greeting words, and just say, I am really interested and fascinated about learning about the culture the way it is, not mm -hmm. you know comparing it uh, to other to see what the norms. Use the word interested. I am. I am. And when you say, you, I mean, I'd like to learn Arabic. I'd like to learn Chaldean. Uh, this is how we advance ourselves when it comes to connecting with each other. Uh, I always say use kind connecting words that will make things a little bit more real and uh, and even break the language. It doesn't matter. Break the language. They will see your heart intention. Then you see your words or whatever. You made a mistake that will make you readily available to learn about other cultures. Uh, those are good ways of really, realistically speaking, uh, doing that. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Send me an email and I'll connect you in the community. OK, thank you. All righty, any other questions? It looks like we might have a quiet group today. Yeah. Um, we did extend the Q&A time because I expected everyone um, similar to our last session to be full of questions. Um, so I'll give everyone just a moment to, um, you know, type any questions in the chat or raise your hand. Let me pick on somebody here, anybody that would like to repeat after me the word hello in Arabic. Just put your hand up. Or unmute yourself and then I'll I'll say it and then you say it after me. Mary has her hand up. Oh I'll Mary, try. you're quite you're quite brave. Mary, say hello in Arabic. Marhaba. Marhaba? Yes. Mar. Yeah. You Mar roll you roll your tongue. Okay, and then like you're in Michigan weather that we've been in for the last, I don't know how long, cold. Marhaba. Marhaba. You got it. And okay. if you say it like this, uh, let's say another uh, word. Kaif uh, Halak. How are you? Kaif Halak. Exactly. Now, Kef Halak, you are addressing a male. Kef Halik. So Kef Halak, go crescendo. Kef Halik, decrescendo. Go up flight when you are taking off and where you're going uh, when you're landing. So you address a female by saying Kef Halik and Kef Halak. Okay. Kef Halak. So Good. this would be for anybody who speaks Arabic, right? Exactly. This is useful Arabic phrases. You can okay. speak to a Chaldean, you can speak to a, an Iraqi, you can speak to a Lebanese, you can, but the accent is going to be different. An Egyptian, actually, for that matter, Yemeni, they will understand when you say hello. The greetings is the greetings. Okay. We are called the language of greetings and swearing. You don't want to learn the swearing. Somebody's laughing here. It's Anybody who's Arabic here uh, with us today that can can ask or speak or whatever. Thank you. Shukran. Shukran. Sugar and sugar and shukran. Okay. Um, we did have a hand up. Lydia, I think it was you. Did you have a question or a statement? No, I was volunteering to learn. Oh, okay. But it's okay. Okay. So uh, go ahead, say uh, good morning. Sabah el khair. Sabah, can you say that one more time? Sabah el khair. The K H is like you want to say. Sabah el khair. Yes, you got it. <laughs> and then uh, goodbye. Uh, 
Ma'i salame. Ma'i salame? Yes, peace be with you, kind of. Okay. Uh, no. La. Very easy. La. La. Yes. Naam. Can you say yes one more time? It froze. Naam. 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 Ah. In there Punjabi, is a we ga. say le. There is a ga. When we say naham, that means the tone of the music. Naham, yes. Or ayu, yeah. Okay. Please, uh, min fadlak. Min fadlak. Yes. I know that one. Okay. I don't know why. <laughs> okay. Uh, other questions? Um, we do have a couple hands up and one question in the chat. So I'm going to read the question in the chat and then I'll get to the hands. So um, Sarah asks, do Chaldeans typically speak Arabic as well as Chaldean? To my understanding, they are different languages as Chaldean is a dialect of um, Amharic, not Arabic. Yes, uh, the Chaldeans, if you know the Aramaic, uh, the Chaldean comes from the Aramaic, the Arabic come from the Aramaic, the Hebrew comes from the Aramaic. So the Chaldean is more of a dialect, but it is totally different than Arabic. Uh, the 80% of the Chaldean people only converse 20% of the Chaldean people read and write because they, uh, 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 people who, who uh, read and write, uh, went to the churches and learned it at home and took classes to read and write because the Chaldeans went to the Arabic schools. So they learned how to speak, read and write Arabic. That's why the Chaldeans are trilingual. They can uh, uh, speak Arabic, read and write Arabic, but can converse Chaldean, 80% of the population who are Chaldeans. Alrighty, Jordan, you had a question. Did you want to unmute yourself to ask? Yeah, I think I'm unmuted. Uh, my hairdresser is Chaldean. And my stepmother is Iranian. Okay. And uh, they both have a uh, phrase that is common. It's mushala, right? The, what does it say it again? Mushala, mushala. Insha'Allah. Uh, no, mushala, like, uh, uh, like that's a good thing. Oh. Thank, thank goodness. I see, I see. Is that? Masha'Allah. Mish mushallah. Masha Allah. Okay. Masha. Now, Iranian, remember, are uh, li they live in Iran. They speak the Farsi language. Right, right. They are all Muslims. They can read the Quran, but they don't understand it. So they speak Farsi. Their Quran is Arabic, and they have to learn Arabic to be able to understand it. Now, uh, the Chaldean, of course, in Sha or Masha Allah, they will understand those. Those there are words that they can understand because uh, Chaldean also have some Arabic words, mm -hmm. which means Masha Allah. This is good. This is great. This is yeah. unbelievably uh, cute or handsome or you know. Mm -hmm. God has given the blessing on it or something like that. Yeah, so there's different words that uh, go across different Absolutely. cultures. Absolutely, yeah, different and, cultures. But um, I, people in Iran can be Baha'i too, right? They don't have to be Muslim? Can be, yeah, can have different sects. Absolutely. Uh, but the religion. majority there are Muslims okay. from different sects. Baha'i, Sunni, uh, Shiite, Mostly the Shiite, I think, in, in Iran. Okay. And there are a very, 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 very minute, minute Christian uh, people from Iran. 
OK, thank you. You're welcome. You must have a good haircut. We are good uh, barbers. Uh, I just had uh, my haircut actually with a Chaldean. I've known him for the last 15 years. I would not go anywhere but him. <laughs> she's a she's a woman. She's awesome. OK, they're fantastic too. They even she more is. detail oriented. She's fantastic. Very patient. Yeah. All right, Aaron, you have your hand up next. You can unmute to ask your question. Hi, um, thank you so much for giving this presentation. It's been very informative and um, just a good introduction for me, but uh, I do have a question. I feel like a lot of cultures can connect over food and, yes. you know, I, I love the food <laughs> of your country. And um, so I guess I'm just wondering, you know, typically I'll hear it called Mediterranean food, but is that correct? Yes, yes. OK, we borrow from each other. <laughs> okay. We borrow spices from each other. We always love to brag about our food. We are entitled. This is negative. The way we do it. And I want to be candid. I, I mean, there are so many borrowed from Greece, the baklava. The sweet, some of it is and we like to claim it's, it's our own. It's not. Uh, Middle Eastern like to take uh, possession of things in a way. So, uh, but really the traditional dishes, nobody can mess because the taste is different. Hmm, okay. You have Jordanian dishes, you have Yemeni dishes, you have, they are proud of their dishes, the folklore dishes that are uh, given the spices within the culture itself. And that what makes everybody unique in this sense. But of course, tabbouleh, everybody likes to own tabbouleh or hummus. Everybody likes to own hummus. Everyone, you know, those are the shared uh, kind of uh, uh, dishes. Awesome. Thank you for that. And food, believe me, I always say hungry stomachs have no ears to hear. When you fill the stomach with food, you could bypass any cultural differences and you can learn about each other's culture and fast and become great friends. Yes, yeah, that's why I love food so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, we did have just a kudos to you, Willie, in the chat that um, this presentation was excellent. Um, and I I did all that absolutely, um, but I just wanted to give um, anyone else with remaining questions just a moment to ask that before we move on to answering the quiz questions from earlier. Remember, this is a journey between us. This is uh, who we are in the community. We are living here. We're not going anywhere. Uh, uh, we are all of us uh, in a way misfits in, in our own ways. Uh, have you ever seen red nose uh, the reindeer, the red nose reindeer? That uh, they become misfits and they want to go to a different island. We cannot go. We are going to be in the same island. So uh, this is a good segue of us really relating to each other. Um, so I would say experience food, experience people. It, you just be genuine and and love period without assumption and that will will get you somewhere in the hearts of people that's my experience i am here you can email me you can you can after the meeting after the training you can uh, send your uh, email to me and i'll try to help as much as and if i can then we will learn together OK, if there is no question, Caitlin, should we move with this? I see you are yep, not. No here. questions, so I got the um, quiz up there for you, ready to go. OK, uh, please make sure to complete the evaluation. I just want to uh, make sure that you send that back to uh, Caitlin so that we can learn and see how we can improve all of these things. Again, I wish this is an in-person. I would have brought all of the uh, artifacts with me uh, and then we would have brought a sweet uh, uh, tray of baklava so you can also try that. Uh, so the Arab Chaldean culture quiz. Uh, just shout out, I mean, or if you want to write it, that's fine in the uh, sharing. 
but you can shout out. Uh, all Muslims are Arabic, true or false? False. False. Can you give me data on this? Anybody? Um, not statistical data, but I'm from India and we have Indian Muslims. Yes. And there's Pakistani Muslims because from India. So you got it. Yeah. So 12% of the world Muslim population is Arabic. Indonesia is the most populated Muslim country with estimated over 200 million Muslims. Pakistan, and they speak a different language, of course. Uh, Pakistan is 160 million. Uh, India, 150, over 150 million Muslims. Bangladesh, over 125 million. Uh, Egypt, it's in the African continent. They speak Arabic. But really, they're not part of the Arab world. They're part. Well, uh, they are part of the Arab world, part of the 22 countries that are part of in the African continent. Uh, and they compose 72 million. Uh, Turkey is 71 uh, million Muslims. Nigeria, 68 million. Iran is 64 million, but they speak different language. OK, let's go to the next one. All Arabic people are Muslims. No. False. False. Uh, there are Christians who are in the Arab world minority. There are uh, Judaism uh, in the Middle East. Uh, there are, uh, uh, of course, uh, the minority religious groups of uh, the um, uh, Menda'i. Those are the John the Baptist followers. They have their own religion and they have there are small different sects in as diverse as you can imagine uh, religious wise. Afghanistan, Iran and Turkey are Arabic speaking people. No, Turkey speaks Turkish. OK, right. OK, Chaldeans can be Muslims or Christians depending on what region in Iraq they are from. Aren't Chaldeans Christians? So is this false or? Uh, it's, I'd say false. False, you're right. Uh, uh, all Chaldeans are Christian Catholic that uh, uh, or Christian Orthodox mm -hmm. or evangelicals at that point. Uh, name three famous uh, Arab Americans. Casey Kasem. Yes. And who's Casey Kasem? The voice of Shaggy. Yep. 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 Mike George from Melody Farms. Uh, Doug Flutie, Heisman Trophy winner in 1984. First quarterback to pass for 10K yards in college football. Uh, activist uh, Ralph Nader. I think it's Salma Hayek. Is she? Salma Hayek. Salma Hayek. Steve jo uh, Jobs. Uh, founder and CEO and chairman of Apple. Najib Halabi. Former CEO of the uh, uh, something f f flight uh, aviation. Whose daughter is Lisa Halabi. And she went on to marry King Hussein of Jordan. She became Queen Noor of Jordan. She changed her name, but that's who Queen Noor is, Lisa Halabi. George Malouf Jr., he's the owner of the Palm Casino Resort in Vegas. Uh, and, you know, there's many, uh, many other uh, uh, Arabic, famous Arabic uh, people. All right. In Iraq, most Chaldeans were persecuted and not supported by Saddam Hussein. Yeah, true. True? I think so. T false, actually. False, OK. Yeah, this is false because many were supported by Saddam. Well, this could go both ways. Yeah. 
But if you made a mistake, you are gone, whether you are Muslim, Christians, Baha'i, no matter what, you are just executed. We know how brutal he was using nuclear uh, uh, on his own people. And there were cemeteries by the groups that were buried because of that. Uh, OK, Arabs in America are considered white and not a minority group. True, true. They are minority group. Oh, but they never were classified according to the census. They were never under the they are actually uh, considered white, but really, to be honest with you, uh, this is a minority group and and uh, that has to be classified in a better way. The census has to be changed and hopefully in 10 years uh, we'll be impacting some kind of change in bringing that because uh, that would mean more services, um, not just to this population, but to the other um, immigrants and, and refugees. OK. Uh, Chaldeans are of Arab descent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, 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 they're not of Arab descent. If you go in history, just Google, go to Ammo Google, which means Uncle Google and uh, Google Chaldean history and it will give you the Babylonians, the, you know, Assyrian, all that. And then you can begin to uh, put the meat on, on, on that, historically speaking. Uh, the Arabic and Chaldean languages have many similarities. True. Explain the difference between refugees and immigrants. What are, what's the definition of refugee? What's the definition of immigrants? Refugee, I think, is somebody who's escaping something. Yes. An immigrant is somebody who's willingly going from one place to another. Absolutely true. Please give Pat on your back. Uh, this is a learning experience uh, that we've had. And any other questions uh, that uh, that you would like to entertain at this point? Otherwise, we're going to let you out question. early today. I have a question, please. Yes, ma'am. About about the culture being patriarchal. That's how do we negotiate with that from the traditional, more American culture. Let me give you a secret. They say it's patriarchal, right? In actuality, if we consider the man the head of the household, the woman is the neck of the household, then the woman, the neck of the household, can move the head of the household any way she wants. This is a hidden kind of way of looking at it. And remember, when it comes to providing uh, support for the ego of the male, so you speak to the male and you know that the male's mouth is going to speak per the next house. OK, so I would address the male. Recognize the male, but also uh, indirectly get to the female through the male. And that's how you begin to create alliances. If the male is really, really the patriarchal and he's so jealous and he's so wanting his ego and wanting his, you know, to be recognized, then separate the male from the female. You know, there are things that you can you can uh, do to be able to really understand more of the dynamic of that family. Remember, in, in the process of acculturation, you have to take into consideration the English language, you have to take into consideration uh, religion, you have to take into consideration the uh, where they came from, uh, have they come in from a rural area, from a city, all of these, uh, are they on the assimilation kind of a spectrum or are they still on the acculturation kind of spectrum? And those are good indicators to help us be direct or indirect and in the way to uh, 
uh, learn more information and include those kinds of information in the treatment process in the way we can address and, and uh, put goals uh, for them to be able to work on. Thank you. You're welcome.